Every war has its battles. It's the glorious ones that the nation likes to celebrate, and the others, we prefer to forget. The battle in this film is one we would like to erase. A French tragedy covered by secret defense. It happened on August 18, 2008 in a valley somewhere in Afghanistan. It took the name of the Yuzban ambush. The French soldiers were mostly young paratroopers who were on their first mission. They fell into a trap set by Taliban fighters. Ten were killed in a few hours. These images, shot a few days before the battle, tell their story that of shattered innocence of 20-year-olds who dreamed of adventure and heroism. That's what we want to see, Dad. That's it. That's what we want to see. The French army had not suffered such heavy losses before. Ten dead and 21 injured in Afghanistan while fighting against the Taliban. It's a very heavy toll. The French regiment, as part of NATO forces, perished in an ambush by the Taliban that lasted all night east of Kabul. These French military personnel are participating in the International Assistance Force. They were the target of a Taliban attack. The Usman ambush has become the symbol of war led by France in Afghanistan. 12 years of a distant, deadly conflict and misunderstandings, with no winner or loser. Warrant Officer Sebastian Devez, Sergeant Damien Bill, Sergeant Nicholas Grigoire, Sergeant Rodolphe Pennon, Corporal Melum Bauma, Corporal Kevin Chassing, Corporal Damien Gaillet, Corporal Julian Lupahum, Corporal Anthony Riviere, Corporal Alexis Tani. I wanted your names to be spoken in this courtyard where so many prestigious names were pronounced before yours. The survivors of Usman formed a separate fraternity. For the first time, some of them, those who left the army, agreed to testify. The others did not get the authorization of the general staff. Their words, their personal archives and drawings, created through their memories, take us into the heart of the ambush. I never thought I would find myself on a day like August 18th, the day I signed up, that's for sure. When you saw that you were alone, you tell yourself, when is it going to stop? Where is the outcome then? It is the real first experience of fire. The first and the last. Nightmares. It's still happening, thinking about it. It is often, very often. Even today, it's a part of our life. Most soldiers who were killed and injured belong to the 8th Regiment paratroopers in the Marine Infantry, an elite regiment. A year after signing up, the recruits received the order to leave for Afghanistan. They integrate their new family, the Carmen II Combat Section, led by Adjutant Gaten Hever. For them, he is more than a chief, he's almost a second father. Yes, it is a section of young parachutists. Yes, they were well trained. Yes, they had incredible energy, and it's true, I would have followed Adjutant Hevert 
to the end of the world. There you go. You know, the history of this country was written, unfortunately, with the blood of 18, 19, 20-year-old kids, and well beyond that, in very dark periods. There are some who didn't really like it. I also remember, they were scared, but this is normal, this is understandable, they saw more of this side, it was still quite dangerous. And then others, like me, had the desire to go there, to at least know that a soldier can be frightened. But he keeps it to himself, you know. At the end of July 2008, parachutists discover Afghanistan, a country at war for 30 years. When we really arrive at the tarmac in Kabul, in the heat, we see that we are in another country, compared to everything outside. And we see a country at war. Everything is secured, we immediately grab our weapons. Even the tone of the leaders changes. We're in, we've arrived, we're right in the middle of it. Everything changes. For me, that's what I wanted. When I signed up, that was what I wanted, to go on a mission, to see the country. And then, Afghanistan, when it came up, it meant having direct contact as well. We feel very strong, we feel invincible, we are ready. There is cohesion, yes, that's it, we're in the big leagues. And then I don't know if it's the right way to say it, but we're going to be a little like in the movies, except that's not just like in the movies. The shocking side? Me, I always remember going to the warehouse, and seeing the flags at half-mast, especially the French flag. When we saw the flag at half-mast, we said, there are casualties. The next day we went to the ammunition dump to collect all the ammo boxes. And the guy who gave us ammo told us, it's useless for me to give you much because you won't be using it much. So we loaded our guns, we prepared our vests. Correctly in relation to the weapons we had, the grenades on one side, everyone put their things away a bit. There were many moments of silence and in those moments, everyone was in their own bubble. The summer of 2008 marks a turning point. Taliban resumes the offensive and losses within the international coalition are getting worse. The soldiers of the 8th RPI must spend their first two weeks around Kabul. They drive in armored vehicles called VB and film their first patrol. Windows closed, no air, the sound of the engine behind getting hot, confined, no space with the bulletproof vest. 
Me, I had my bottles there, my gun here, all my magazines there, the helmet. I was like that. I was very, very sick. There you go, my friend Noel, also known as Cacao. <laughs> then the heat really, it crushes you, it's sweltering. I remember we were drenched. We drank 10 liters of water a day. All the little ones, when they do that, they're happy. Then as soon as we pass, they do this, you know, like, you're not welcome here. It feels weird at first, the six-year-old boy telling you that, you know it's not him who's going to hurt you. He does that to me at six. What does he want? We were on guard all the time, and you had to be. A farmer during the day, maybe a Taliban at night. That's the whole problem, because you can't recognize it. Most of the time, they're dressed the same way. They all have their beards, their jalabas, the traditional Afghan dress. So it's impossible to differentiate between a villager and a Taliban. Impossible. Gregory, Jean Christophe, Mayul, Julian and their comrades are then sent to the Tora forward base, located 60 kilometers from Kabul. We are really in the desert, with only mountains. There is nothing. We wonder how we are going to stay here for four months. Welcome to the KC-20 from part of Group 23. As you can see, there is a lot of space. When we arrived, it was a very small camp. The rooms were rooms for six, so we had to adapt and cut scraps of wire mesh to make coat racks or small wardrobes. So we were very close. You had to be organized. Very, very organized. And here is my bed. All the photos you have sent us. A small makeshift shelf. We do what we can with what we have. In this case, not much. Kiss, check for everyone. It was for you, everyone. In Torah, the knights belong to the enemy. The soldiers take turns at the base, the station overlooking the base, to stand guard. It took half an hour to go up. The path was traced in chalk because it was mined all around. So when we went up, you had to be careful. Everything is worse we because mostly went up at night. We know that there are enemies around. It's serious. So we're really keeping an eye out. We think a little about everything. We think about where they could come from. We're not too serene, you know. But we could open fire, if need be without necessarily waiting for the authorization of our superiors. Every time we saw colleagues who were leaving, we asked them when they were coming back, if they had a run-in or not, and then, until then, I don't think I remember that there was a collision. As long as there has been no collision, we're not really in it.
Good chief, a short word for the patrol? Nothing to report. The main thing is that we are well. That's the main thing. A few days later, the paratroopers are given a first risky mission, patrol in the famous Usman Valley, which is the crossing point for the Taliban, who have infiltrated from neighboring Pakistan. The Corporal Chief Bui takes our whole group to explain what's going to happen. We had a mission to patrol the region and then to observe all night. And then he announces to us that, in fact, according to the information, there are hundreds of Taliban a bit further north. And we're going to go over there. So it might get risky, there is a risk of having a run-in with them. Before leaving on this mission the people were... There was a weird feeling, I think, and everyone felt it. Everyone told themselves that this mission felt strange. I think there are a lot of people who called their family, or their girlfriends, or wives to tell them that, to simply talk to them. To prepare for the mission, another section of paratroopers were sent to Usman for scouting, three days earlier. They establish a first contact with the inhabitants of the valley. The first person who came to meet us was an Afghan who spoke English fluently and said he was from the police. But he was dressed in civilian clothes and he was constantly on his phone. During the first contact with my section manager and myself, It inspires treachery because he was the first Afghan we encountered who was fluent in English. He was always on his phone and asked a lot of questions. I thought it was weird to let this guy come meet us, when it's usually us who go to meet them. I told my lieutenant that it's weird anyway. It's weird that this guy behaves like that. He's gone. We didn't see him again, and we went back to the base in the evening. This first mission in the zone the Taliban must last 48 hours. Just as before each departure, the section checks its equipment. We're starting to get ready. We had to leave pretty early. We were leaving with troops of the ANA, the Afghan National Army. We were leaving too with the regiment from Chad, RMT, and also with Americans. In short, we were ready. It was supposed to be 5 a.m., 6 a.m., I don't know anymore. We were ready and waiting, because some people were late. There you start to feel that it's going to be heated and we're going to have to be on our guard and pay attention to each other. And above all, watch out for the population outside, and pay attention to the surrounding area. Quel âge 45 ans 
À 30... Ah, <rire> bon, vas-y, tu viens voir. Bon, explique-nous là ce qu'on va faire aujourd'hui. Ce qu'il y a de bien, ce qu'il y a de bien. Faut tirer le côté positif. Positif. Non, mais en fait, regardez, pour la petite blague. Le fils nous avons dit à l'interprète, nous allions, il n'arrête pas de téléphoner. Non. We take it seriously more or less. So it's true that there's a lot of crap, but now it's true that it was serious. And then there's an interpreter. Well, it showed that he wasn't wasn't serene. He was asking a lot of questions. The time of the mission, where we were going, with whom, all that stuff about us, you know. Well, a quick note for your wife, because you're going to die today. But I'll take care of her, don't worry. Letter from the front. Darling, I'm writing to you, using the light tracking bullets. The cannon that is next to me sends me burning sockets on the face. But the pain is less intense only when I think of you, baby. I love you. Let's get the guys on board. We'll take the photos later. I think that at one o'clock we were in the village. With VABS, we could no longer have access to the village. And the area, we could only go there on foot, so... So the patrol went down, and us at the VABs, we put ourselves in position, in a 360-degree support, each soldier at a shooting angle. In the village, we were not welcome. People told me to leave. They weren't happy we were there. Then you get out of vehicles to begin the recon of the village and the climb. We are around 20. So we start to go up. In single file, we go up. It's still very hot with the equipment. In my cabin, the radio is one meter away from me, so I hear everything that is said. The group leader asks if the VABs below support us well. The answer is yes, everything is going well. We are in a position to support you, we don't see any movement. So we're going up, and at some point, Noel has a heat stroke and makes a big fuss. with the temperature and equipment. He has a stroke of fatigue, a heat stroke. And so, we have to stop. There is the corporal who tells me to stay with them. So we're left with a small group of four, and the others continue their ascent. At that moment, Master Corporal Pennon hydrates Noel to make him feel better. But we stay for a little while. The time for him to regain his strength. All of a sudden, there is a woman who starts screaming. And there's chaos in every direction. I thought it was an altercation that it was a small group who attacked us, that it was going to pass. And I see this rocket landing right behind me. And now, I have a reflex, I'm sagging, I go in, and there, in two seconds, I ask myself 3,000 questions. What did we learn? What should I do? My magazines are here, I have my noise-canceling earplugs. Everything's fine. 
The ambush was prepared in way to leave no survivors. On the French side, the Taliban, who are five times more numerous, hold the ridges. Julian is near the village, in his armored vehicle. Not far from him is Jean Christophe, he's also in an armored vehicle. Higher up the hill, exposed to insurgent fire, Gregory is with his group of four soldiers. Finally, Mayul, who belongs to a reinforcement section, is still at the Tor base. They're attacking again. The adjutant said on the radio, we are in contact on the ridgeline. They're everywhere. We need to stack along the ridgeline. I had binoculars with me, and with the binoculars, I was trying hard to see, to be able to help. But in fact, in the end, the Taliban were so well prepared that they had built caches, and also a place to put their guns, and to hold watch. So we couldn't see anything. We're staying a small group of four. And there are the chief corporals, starting to fire in the direction of the fire. And at one point, Corporal Chief Pennon was injured, he got shot. And our Chief Corporal asks me and Noel to go get him, so already, it's starting to feel the first. Apprehensions. We take him as we can, you can't by foot, but we got out pretty quickly. And he was already in pain, because his leg was rubbing on the ground. And so we take him, we shoot, but that's hard, it's not as easy as you'd think. So we hide him under a tree. We give him his morphine injection, and then we give him ours too, he can't walk anymore. But he is still able to think, and inject himself. And then after that, my chief corporal tells me, Martin, go get the gun over there. It's not easy, you know. Twenty-five minutes after the start of the battle, reinforcements urgently leave Tora base. The convoy takes one hour to arrive on site. One hour during which the soldiers listen on the radio, every second of the battles fought by their companions. I could hear everything told by the Carmen II Regiment. I could hear the gunshots on the radio. I could hear the head of section call for help. We are further away, we say. I could hear screaming around him. You could obviously hear all the gunshots, him saying that his entire section was scattered, that we had to arrive they were getting shot at, that they were under fire. My mate was in front of me. I started vomiting because I was scared. We were all scared. Some smoke cigarette after cigarette. Some were starting to reload their guns. Me? I was constantly on the radio. I was doing radio work. I didn't have time to think about anything else. Tony was one I knew best in the section. As he was in charge of the Carmen 2 radio, that was a link that brought us together. Then I didn't hear him anymore and I heard Warrant Officer Heverd. He mentioned that he was starting the CPR and that Tony was hit. And after a few minutes, he died. Of course, it really came as a shock to me. No longer hearing his voice and no longer being able to talk to him. To tell myself that I won't see him again I won't see him tomorrow. Yes, that really shocked me. Bullets, even if you can't see them, you hear the sound they make, and you can feel them getting closer. It's not even the detonation, it's the sound of bullets passing by. The trap closes in on the section. Cut off from the rear lines, left to themselves, the soldiers can't understand why the mortars at the back stay hopelessly silent. 
The adjutant asks what is going on, why? Why isn't the mortar support coming? So we pushed as hard as we could. The adjutant kept asking for a mortar support that never came. And then the RMT lieutenant says radio silence. He kept silent. It wasn't coming, was it? The more the mortar support was delayed, the more intertwined we became. We could no longer rely on the support of mortars. It was too late. So now the unit commander decides to make us disembark. And then the fighting begins. Fighting the Taliban who were in front of us, I no longer have memories. But for several hundred meters they were invisible. And that's it. That was quite frustrating. I told myself all the time, what is the matter with the Air Force, mortars? What happened to all that? After a while, I see that there is a helicopter coming. I see that it wants to shoot. But the fight is so close that the helicopter comes and goes. This job requires a certain degree of rational intelligence. And then at some point, instinct. Should we go or not? Should we take the left path or the right one? Should we take off or not? We land a kilometer away or we land right on it. So that's a big part of intuition. And that's one of the difficulties that can be skewed by simply stepping in to help the other and to take risks that are even crazier. The entire question is, how do we manage to get out of this gradual encirclement, which is likely to bring us to an absolute massacre, that is to say, all detachments? Killed by the Taliban. Carmen Section 2 is decimated. With the help of reinforcements, Adjutant Hever tries to pull back to save, among his men, those who can still walk. Heverd says they're not going to last much longer, that the section is completely scattered, that he doesn't know where his men are. There are casualties, and they're struggling to descend the pass, but every time someone is shot, that they really need to get there quickly, intervene because otherwise, they're all going to get killed. Eventually, I see another adjutant, with other colleagues, and at that moment, we became a little more aware of the situation. Because they were with a large part of the group, and when we go down, we note he is injured. And that's where we learn that we're surrounded. That the Taliban are everywhere, that there is no one who can come and get us. Nobody will be able to put themselves in the shoes of Warrant Officer Everard. And I think he always carries, deep within himself, this overwhelming responsibility. That is double in fact, it may be, he said to himself. The days when the positive view gets stronger, I made the right decision by allowing to save and remove most of my section and then finally could we have done more but it's always this way it's always this way and he'll live with that so the only thing that we can do is wait wait here for now by fighting back trying not to go down to repel the enemy that you don't necessarily see and then, hoping to get out of it, that's it. Suddenly, at that moment, you feel a little alone, we tell each other. We are alone in the world. Or, what are we going to become? Maybe we're not going to make it. I had a reaction a bit later, when night started to fall. I took a bullet from my magazine and put it in my pocket. I thought, that one is mine. They won't get it. I saw one of my mates in the distance, paralyzed. He had, I think, put his helmet on. He was scared. He couldn't shoot anymore. He seemed to have put the gun down, hidden against a rock, and could no longer do anything. 
But when we saw the A-10 coming, it's a bit like our savior. It's an American plane. It's huge. It makes a tremendous noise. And then it cuts up a mountain in two. It's thanks to helicopters and to American planes that we managed to get out. And so, throughout this period of uncertainty, we know that what is happening is very serious, but we don't know what is going to be the final result. Aerial bombings and the intervention of mortars at the end of the afternoon changed the course of the battle. Warrant Officer Everard and his group of survivors are trying to go back to the village. Julian and Jean Christophe, who stayed in their tanks, decide to go meet them. But the injured must be evacuated. Taunton and I looked at each other. We said, it's hopeless. We're not going to just sit here and wait for things to happen. So we decided to go back to the village. So now, we go into the village. We couldn't, because there was shooting everywhere. We were getting shot at. I had flat tires. The windows were all riddled with bullets. I could not move forward. And he tells me that we have to leave. We had no choice. It was impossible to go any further. We're going backwards, and there was a hole in the ditch. He used to beat me with rangers, in the helmet, repeating, you can't. I did my best, I had to get out. I was starting to fall, I had to get out. And now I might be 50 meters away. Now I get a rocket. It didn't explode. In fact, it ricocheted. Perhaps that's it. There is a pin. And he forgot to remove the pin. So what makes the rocket... Excuse me. It's all right. And so the rocket ricochets off the vehicle. It taps the vehicle. It somehow makes an internal blast effect. The air was trapped inside. It needed to be released. So I was thrown out. We call that a blaster. Blaster is an internal bleeding, overpressure of air. And so I believe I was more clear-headed. My VAB wasn't advancing. I was deaf. I couldn't hear anything. And then Tonton tells me, we have to evacuate the VAB. We need to evacuate the VAB. There's no other way around it. Now I remember there was a bullet coming, right in front of me. I am shocked, because it was coming at me. I have the instinct to touch the window. I was lost. I tell myself, it's close to me, but there's a bulletproof glass between us. Tonton tells me, we have to leave, you have to leave. It seems that the adjutant is dead, he was already injured. And then, we start trying to join the VABs, the VAB that had remained because the others had gone a bit further away. We are ordered to leave, but me. With my pilot, we hear that there are comrades who will soon be here. So we decided to stay. We tell each other that. We can't leave them like that. We can't let them down like this. While there are two who fire to make heads bow, and two who advance and conceal themselves. After they fire, we move forward and in fact, at that time. I don't know why we weren't hurt, but in fact the bullets were unbelievable when we were running. There were bullets everywhere. I don't know what saved us from being hurt, but on the other hand, there is an interpreter who was killed during this time. When I see them coming, I see them, they are, they are injured, they are and they look tired. 
ils sont blessés, ils sont euh, et ils ont l'air fatigués. And finally, euh, I see that they went through hell up there. We hit the road. Perhaps we've covered a quarter. Moi, avec mon pilote, on prend la route. On fait euh, peut-être un quart d'heure. An hour's drive away, they're shooting at us. On nous tire dessus. Euh, on voit, on voit les. I hear bullet holes on the BB. Well, it was hard. And upon arriving at the extraction zone, the injured have come out. I screamed, who had injured people, but we don't fully realize everything that happened to us. Sergeant Andrio made a list with the names of people he knew who had fallen. And I'm heading towards Sergeant Andrieu. He had marked me off. He thought that I was dead. He was happy to see me. And now I see a large figure approaching and I ask, what happened? Because he was up there and I was down there. It was not the same story. I didn't see the same things. He tells me they are all dead. I was taken aback. He was completely shocked. There he was, staring blankly. At nightfall, the results of the ambush is not yet known. The Carmen 3 reinforcement team receives the order to reclaim the pass, to rescue the wounded hidden in the mountains, and to recover the bodies of dead soldiers. And recover the bodies of dead soldiers. You rake, and then you start to stumble upon the first casualties. So now we find the first three bodies, three initial visions of the war of the dead. For me, that's when I saw Tani. It's a shock because he was one of the soldiers that I knew the best from Carmen too. So that's it. And also, having followed the battle in the afternoon, seeing him there now, facing me, three centimeters away from me, lying on the ground, mouth open, hands clenched, and stripped of all his gear. It was really hard. Upon reflection, we realized that, if we were in their shoes, we would have done the same. First you kill him, then you take his stuff. We would have done the same thing. But it's true that at the time, it's striking, it's impressive, there is anger, a spirit of revenge, a whole lot of stuff. We were a bit lost. Now we are evacuated to the warehouse camp, which is being used as a hospital. I was totally lost, I was stunned, I couldn't hear anything. They were talking to me, but I only saw a mouth that moved. And so we arrived in Kabul, and again they tried to talk to me, and I was completely deaf. So they asked me to give my gun. But I didn't want to give it away. It was my gun, and it was out of the question that I leave my gun. So I had to be seated. Someone explained. Someone told me that it was over, that I had to return my gun. They probably spent 10 minutes explaining to me that I had to let go of my gun. Here I stand, observing distant silhouettes, on the track. And it's true that they were people, they were friends. And in fact, they were around Damien Bill's body. I had talked to him that same morning, at breakfast before we went on patrol. He had just received a call from his wife, who informed him that it was going to be a boy and a girl and he was super happy. We talked for two minutes. It seems to me that it was his birthday as well. And then the last one, the one I went to mass with the day before, Julian Lepahun, who had just arrived at the area. And there he was, with a bullet in the head and a shot in the leg. All alone, nothing around him, only sand, only rock, no plants. The same as the others, stripped of all his gear. So we brought all the bodies, we lined them up. 
and we smoked. I smoked half a pack of cigarettes with my mates around them. I was sitting close to them. I started to feel nauseous, so I went to vomit after that on the side next to him. Then some of us cracked a bit. There were also officers who took a step back a little bit, who had tears in their eyes, like a lot of this team that were in the area that morning. The next day, the president arrives in Kabul and sees the price paid by young parachutists. Ten killed and 21 injured, all on the same day. We have to go back to the Algerian war to trace such significant human losses in combat. That's my real memory. He is an angry president of the Republic, that's clear. Against whom? Because now, it's a failure. When there are so many deaths, no one can explain these situations. Sometimes faced with silence or approximations, we had a head of state who, by the nature of his character, was more inclined to speak. You will need to provide a detailed explanation of how it happened. We want to decide on operations, but we would like it to go without problems. It doesn't happen that way. It never happens like that. It never happened like this in history, and it will never happen like that. There is no military operation that does not involve risks. It was in August. France is on vacation. There was nothing going on and all of a sudden is a clap of thunder. The French discover that they are waging war on the other side of the planet. The French war in Afghanistan now has a face, that of families of the soldiers who fell in Uzbin. But behind their suffering, the first questions are coming up. Did the military hierarchy make mistakes? Was the French army ready to face this type of insurgency? The battle makes the military field a national issue. The ambush becomes the Usbin affair. The president at the Les Invalides Hotel gave a very nice speech on the virtues of the soldiers. But there's one thing, you have to find or determine the responsible party. Now you are in the news. And it's not surprising that the families in that case end up saying, it is not normal that our sons are dead. We have to know why. Tell us why. As head of the armed forces, I don't have the right to consider the death of a soldier a fatality. I'll see the families in a few minutes. I want them to know everything, they have the right to it. I want all the lessons be drawn from what happened. After all, we now have a professional military force. And finally, a connection is established quite quickly. Job and work, who is to blame for workplace accidents? And it affects almost everything. The whole spectrum of jobs of our society. The problem is that being a soldier is not a job like the others. That's for sure. Chantal and Jean-Francois are Damien Bills' parents. He is one of the soldiers who died in the Usbin Valley on his birthday. 
With six other families, they decided to take legal action against senior officers for failure to assist a person in danger. They accused them of having poorly prepared the mission and for sending poorly equipped soldiers on the front line. With Usbin, for the first time, the French army finds itself on trial and it's the civil justice system that is handling the investigation. Losing your son today, fighting in a conflict on the other side of the world. I mean, it seems completely outdated. With the resources we have, with all the means we have, and to fight hand to hand, like 50 years ago. Me personally, I thought it was over, that it no longer existed. If he had fallen because he had stepped on an IEE or was in his VAB, you would have said it's destiny, it's like that. This is destiny too, but it was a forced one, it was forced. That's why we, with my wife and other family members, we have this anger. We feel that because we think that it should never have happened, never, never, never. So as a result of that, out of the ten families, seven of them wished to file a complaint. Not against the army, especially not against the army. It was our children's family. Their second family, it was their second family, it's what they were telling us. But when these people organized this mission, we estimate that there was a serious misconduct and that these people should be punished for the fact that they did not take precautions. They did not provide maximum security and not even minimum security. The problem is older than that. The issue is much older than that. It's with this country, our beautiful and old country, was deeply affected by the major mass murders of the last century, the First World War, Second World War, colonial wars, etc. Indochina, Algerian War, and then Finally, there is a kind of aversion, clear and definitive, for war and human losses. Muzbin, for me, is the moment where I discover that we are in a society that no longer has resilience. There is no more capacity to bear the blows. We are in modern societies that are trying to erase death all the time. And as for me, what really struck me, it is bad debates. As if it was necessary to always find someone to blame, as if there were necessarily people to be accused. So we lost. I don't know how much. 88 soldiers have died in Afghanistan as I speak. In this Maccabre countdown, we lost a lot less than other countries. Twelve years in Afghanistan. It's 22 minutes from the War of 14. The reality of numbers, I measure everything behind us pain for families, for having shared it and for sharing it again. At a certain moment, the nation has to ask itself, up to what point am I ready to accept the risk to defend my essential interests? That is the real question. We did not register death for France because he didn't die for France. I deeply regret it. He died for world peace. It's completely different. Me, I bumped into people because they say they died for France and no, I'm sorry, they are in Afghanistan and did not die for France, dead for France. I would like it to be in France or French territory, other than France. But that is not the case. So we say defense of the homeland, but why in Afghanistan? Everyone needs to understand. It's no longer the safety of the French people. It's no longer Vauban's exclusive domain. It's not even the enlarged Europe of 27 states, right? Today, the safety of the French people is understood on a global scale. On hindsight, the fact that the French army evacuated Afghanistan, let's turn the page on Afghanistan. What do you say to yourself? Was all that for this? We wouldn't have come. It would have been the same.
So are my friends dead for a just cause or not? I don't think so, myself. I'd rather not answer that. For me, they didn't die for nothing. I know that this is the opinion of many others. I know it's very hard for families, and I know that we will never be able to walk in their shoes, that's for sure. But then, I realized that they are committed, they have fought for France and died on the field of honor. Like our grandparents died in Algeria, in Indochina, during the Second World War, it's the same principle. The Usman ambush finally precipitated the withdrawal of the French forces in Afghanistan. In the French countryside, some war memorials honor the soldiers who fell that day. But what meaning should we give to their sacrifice? Did these men die for the nation? Or for other reasons too distant? For lack of response? The memory of Usman nourishes a feeling of anger among families, of injustice among the generals, and bitterness among the survivors, who the public has forgotten. However, there's no doubt that this battle heralds the sacrifices of coming wars.